something. Yes. Not Actually, the time. I, I have Not the time. I have an idea. Too. Always, you always have an idea. I was. Um, I say no to most of them, Danny Meyer. Well, it actually it has to do with Danny. So I was inspired by his speech just now. Yeah. And in the green room, he said I, it was totally cool to take this, but maybe we do a book together. That's um, let's get ready to rumble and eat pasta, based off of his story of kicking somebody in the groin. All right, I'm gonna kick this off. <laughs> Love you so much. Um, and, and very cool to have Kevin introduce me because I think, introduce us because I think he and Rob have had one of the most inspiring partnerships to me. And for many of you know, I lived in Chicago for five years and um, I at one point begged Kevin and Rob to come to New York with me and open a restaurant before I met Sean. Um, so it's pretty cool to have to be here. Uh, I left 11 years ago after a five-year tenure at Spiaggia to, uh, thank you. Shout out thank, Spiaggia. Yes, Spiaggia, thank you. Um, I left to, to follow my, my dreams of finding success in New York. Um, I'm a diehard East Coaster and it was always home to me and Chicago was amazing, but it was always time to go back to New York. Um, and it's just really cool to be here 10, 11 years later standing next to this guy. Um, so this is a conference sort of about future and restaurants of hospitality, but we're gonna start with a little story um, of how Sean and I have even ended up here together. We are, as Kevin said, two really unlikely people to be standing in a room on the stage together, and it's been a pretty extraordinary journey for us, and, and we're just excited to be here and share it with you. Um, in 2014, a year after I left my job at Avoce, uh, I was in, uh, sitting unemployed in my apartment on the afternoon of the James Beard Awards, probably the first time in many years I hadn't been. Um, and I was pretty, feeling pretty sad and lost. And I decided to stream the James Beard Awards, which is probably a really stupid idea when you've removed yourself from the industry and you're feeling pretty shitty about yourself. Um, but I wanted to feel some kind of connection, I guess. And uh, since I had been le left my job, I was just on the hunt for the next thing and mostly the right partner. And Sean Feeney, this guy, uh, lived in a building with me one floor up and he had zero restaurant experience, yet three months before this evening had asked me to be his partner. Uh, we had many conversations. He heard about many meetings I had, he heard about all the deals, and he just wanted to give me advice all the time. Finance guy. Uh, <laughs> and I, I just said no, but I... Repeatedly. Repeatedly. <laughs> Not so nicely. Not so nicely. Correct. You are correct. I He's had stealing all my lines, guys. Um, I kept saying no, but I was really something about him, and, our, and we had become close friends over, over the year that I was unemployed and around our building a lot more. And uh, I, something made me kept coming back to him and wanting to have more conversation, and we had many, many, many dinners. Um, and what about you, t you taught me how to eat with my hands at some of those dinners? I did. I had a bad habit of eating with my hands. I'm a chef. We just pick things up a lot. Uh, so it was disgusting. Yeah. But it, <laughs> by the way, but he then thought, I started doing it. He thought so then, but when we opened a restaurant together, I would have to tell him to get away from the past and stop eating with his fingers. I bought him his own pair of little tweezers, so oh, yes. he would have something to grab food I with. I finally made it. Anyway, uh, over many dinners and eating with our hands, we discovered we had this really shared vision of the kind of company we would want to create, and most of that started with shared family and business values and really had nothing to do with intricacies, intricacies of running a restaurant. So my curiosity still lived on. And the night I watched the James Beard Awards, I watched a lot of my peers and friends get up night, uh, minute after minute thanking their business partners. And I was on the verge of signing a deal with someone else and it didn't feel right. And I had been advised not to go into the partnership I was about to 
And I just kept hearing these people thanking their partner so sincerely and being so proud to stand next to them. And at that moment, I was like, wow, I, I want to feel that way. If ever I'm on a stage of any kind, winning any kind of award, I want to really feel that way. And I wanted to feel supported by someone. And most importantly, I wanted to be able to support someone else. And I always knew that no matter what, I didn't want to open a restaurant by myself. So towards the end of the show, I shut my computer and I ran upstairs. We lived in this weird little building that was like a house. Um, and we didn't close our doors. Um, <laughs> very strange. Um, and uh, I shut the computer and I ran up to Sean's apartment. And I was very teary-eyed and emotional. And I said to him, I, I, I think we should be business partners. And, and I was like, why are you crying? <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong? And I said, I said, you know, I, I had talked to so many people and something just finally felt right about this. And I, I was still had strong feelings of hesitation and fear, but it just felt like it was the right thing to do. And at that night on 50 Grove Street, I can give you the address because we no longer live there. <laughs> um, in the West Village of Manhattan, Grove House was born. And I was leaving his apartment that night feeling really great, pretty positive, a little bit more settled than I had in a really long time. I looked back to him and I said, hey, you have the money, right? <laughs> he said, yeah, sure, I have the money. At that exact moment, I did not. <laughs> I, uh, I hadn't even thought about it until she said yes. Because you have to understand, for three months, night after night, as I was coming home from work, I would knock on her door. Some nights she would act like she wasn't there. <laughs> but I wouldn't stop knocking, and she wouldn't stop saying no. So when she finally did say yes, I was basically shocked. And the door closed at my apartment. I was barreled over. My hands were on my knees. I had felt like Tyson just punched me in the stomach. And I, um, I may or may not have thrown up. But <laughs> 20 minutes, four phone calls, and a bottle of ginger ale later, I had it. And we were ready to go. Our search for a space brought us to a garage on our favorite block in the West Village. Despite us both knowing that it was way too expensive, we still wanted to torture ourselves by looking inside. We were told it was previously used for the past two years as a private studio art gallery by a famous comedian, actor, part-time pet detective. I told you not to use that line. <laughs> as we entered, we were both stopped in our tracks and turned towards the wall, where in neon blue spray paint it read, Will I be enough? We were stopped in silence with our heads cocked to the side, and I broke it. I looked at Missy, and I asked her, will you? And she responded immediately, I don't give a shit. <laughs> Excuse my French, mom and dad. Well, for those of you who know me, probably not surprised at that reaction. Um, I was at a really, really crazy and interesting point in my life and my career. I was 42 years old, and as I mentioned, a year before, uh, in May of 2013, I left a pretty incredible job. I was running two very busy restaurants, each of which had earned a min and maintained Michelin star throughout my five years there. A staff of 75 cooks between the two kitchens. I was making a salary that I never could have even imagined. And, and I was supposedly in my dream job, in the job that I had worked 20 years previously to get. On the other hand, I was also working six days a week most of the time, 14 hours a day. I was really grumpy. I was super overweight. My body was really broken. And more importantly, my spirit was pretty broken. The job was really intense, to say the least. And I couldn't have articulated at the time. And when I was asked why I left the job, I never said that I was burnt out. But I was pretty burnt out, and I was pretty miserable professionally. And I think that showed to a lot of people in, in many, many ways. So I made the choice to take time off, because that's what I thought was the right thing to do. And I gifted myself an entire year. Um, I, I don't 
recommend it financially. But, <laughs> but, but I did do it, and I, I had no game plan, and I had no potential source of income. I lied to Florence Fabricant when she asked me what I was going to do for the year, and I said that I had a book deal. I didn't. Um, <laughs> She really pressed me, like she kept going, and finally I just had to make something up. And I also did not have the secret restaurant project on the horizon that many people thought I had. I knew I needed to do something different. I, need, I knew I needed to figure it out, and I, and I didn't know what it meant. I didn't even know if I wanted to be in the industry anymore. I didn't know if I wanted to cook. I didn't know if I wanted to be a chef. And I, that was really scary. I thought I wanted to go back to school to become a therapist. Um, turns out you can be a chef and a therapist at the same time and you don't have to pay money to go to school for it. Um, and I knew if I went to another job, it would be equally as intense as, as the one I had. Um, so I just took some time off and I knew that the answers would come and, and they did. And they, some took longer than others, but gradually I could see a better and a different picture. For 20 years, I had only wanted to be the best. That was my goal. And at every stage of my career, I wanted to excel at the highest level in this exceptionally competitive field. I've been told many times I'm very competitive. Most of that com competition is with myself. And I moved to New York so I could train with the best when I was a young cook. Nine years later, I went to Italy to learn a new culture and cuisine without knowing a word of Italian. I wanted to open a restaurant by the time I was 30, and I didn't. I picked up and I moved to Chicago for a better job that I would never have gotten in New York at the time. And I always just wanted to be enough. And I always took the steps to get there. When I finally moved back to New York to take that job, I thought it was gonna be the highlight of my career. And I found myself working in these restaurants where I had bonuses attached to Michelin star acquisition and where three star New York Times reviews were the goal. And those tangibles in a way drove me to a point to try and be the best, but as time went on, I certainly didn't feel satisfied with just that. When we went to the space for the first time, I hadn't been working for a year, but I had changed a lot of things in my life. I had started losing weight. I was doing Pilates three times a week with a private trainer. Again, nothing someone unemployed should be doing. <laughs> but it, it changed my life, and six years later, I still do Pilates, but I don't have time to do it three times a week. Um, I was cooking at home more than I had ever cooked. I don't think I'd ever really cooked at home. And I was discovering this new love of true simplicity and the food I was cooking, much of which I was cooking for Sean. Yes, And, and yes, yes, his yes. wife, Maria, who's somewhere here. Oh, right there. Um, and I knew that I, if and when I went back to open a restaurant, that it had to be different than it was in the past. And I simply just wanted to cook food, great food that made people happy in a great environment. And I wanted people to feel like they were coming into my home for dinner anymore, for dinner, only I wanted that home to be much cooler than the one I actually lived in. Um, I wanted to live a more balanced work and home life, and I wanted to be calmer. Uh, I wanted to have a really different relationship to my staff, and I wanted to manage differently. And I didn't want to think about how many stars the restaurant should have. Sean and I never said, like, this is gonna be a two-star or three-star restaurant. We need to get this plate so that we can have this reviewer like this I didn't even thing. know what that meant. I'm not, he still doesn't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Three's good, three's good. <laughs> um, and I didn't wanna think about what a dish should taste like or look like so that we could get a nod from Michelin. So. I saw all these definitions of success were starting to shift for me. And I, at that moment when Sean asked the question, I really didn't give a shit. Sorry, Mom, also. Um, I, didn't, I didn't think about it for a moment. The reaction was so natural for me. And while I said it that way, what I think I really meant was that, yes, I was enough. I was enough for me. And uh, at that moment, I think Sean was in a really different place in his life. After hearing the conviction that she had in her response to my question, I knew she was on her way to becoming the best version of herself. And I was never more excited to ride shotgun on that journey. I wouldn't stop in nothing to help her get there. But I, on the other hand, when I was standing there looking at this freeze, I knew that I was not enough, a feeling and realization that wasn't new to me. 
I had worked at the greatest financial institutions in the world as a corporate bond trader. And similar to Missy, I measured success based on finite goals I set for myself. They just happened to be in the form of a daily P&L, end of year bonus, promotions, or better job offers. The times I would reflect when I did not hit my goals or didn't feel like I was in complete control of my destiny, I'd always come to the same conclusions. You're in this too deep, you can't start over now, and even if you did, what else could you possibly do? I'd convince myself to keep my head down, to keep competing, to keep surviving, and to keep grinding. It was scary as hell to feel like that, but I would find comfort when I had to assure myself that things could be much worse. But at that moment, standing there in the studio, it wasn't clear to me if I would ever become enough. A few months and 30 spaces later, one day I delicately and very hesitantly texted my partner, Missy, that she had to go look at a space in North Williamsburg. Her response was immediate and quite possibly one of the greatest screenshots of all time. I was not allowed to put it up here because of the language. It read, I am not opening a fucking restaurant in fucking Brooklyn. <laughs> I'm so sorry. All right, guys, I have a potty mouth, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me explain a little. I had probably in my life been to Williamsburg a total of three times. Those three times were at night, in the dark, crossing over the Williamsburg Bridge in a taxi before Ubers were really around to go to a loft party. What I knew of Williamsburg was my very hip, tattooed sous chefs with giant earrings in their ears. That's who lived there. And it was like a foreign land to me. And for a year, people had been encouraging me to look anywhere in Brooklyn. And I adamantly just kept saying, no. In addition to my lofty competitive goals, I had a single definition of success. And that definition was to open a restaurant in Manhattan, where I had done the bulk of my training. Going to look at a space in Williamsburg seemed really ridiculous to me and sort of like a failure. But in the spirit of being a good partner <laughs> and in the spirit, frankly, of needing to find a space ASAP before my bank account reached zero, I said I would go. I arrived by car and got dropped off in front of this beat up garage with a large bay door opening and a car sitting plop in the middle of the space. The windows had bars on them, and the glass was cracked and frosted. The ceilings were paneled with white dilapidated boards with wood rafters slightly peeking out. And while I walked around absorbing the car grease in the air, trying to imagine our restaurant in this space, Sean, in his very, very special and aggressive way, <laughs> on the edge of a seat sitting at his desk on the trading floor, kept texting me, how is it, how is it, how is it? Luckily, I have some vision. I have two skills, cooking and creative vision. And I said, I mean, I can see its potential, but I have no fucking idea where I am. As I stood on the corner trying to find the closest subway stop. Our curiosity peaked enough, though, that Sean and I came back several times to see the space and to explore Williamsburg so we can understand it a little better. Where frankly, Sean, and I both look like tourists in our own city. He a little more, he was wearing Gucci loafers. By the way, and his no little, more, I only wear Nike Hang on, I'm not now. to that point yet. Oh. And his little, <laughs> you know those little finance vests that those, the, the, the hedge fund guys wear. <laughs> and I would kind of just keep my head down. And I'll throw a dig at myself, I too have found a little more fashion since those days. Um, we personally, we, we realized that there was an opportunity on this corner and in Williamsburg, different than anything we would find in Manhattan, and certainly more affordable. And for me personally, I realized that the worst thing that could happen was that I would fail, we would open this restaurant, and I would have to get another soulless job. I, and I would just lose a bunch of money. And he would lose some money along with some of his buddies. No big deal. Um, <laughs> no big fine. deal. It's fine. We opened Lily 18 months later on that very corner. We got to slow down, chef. 
because those 18 months were literally months that nearly broke us. Besides the normal headaches of a full restaurant build out, which we had never done before, um, and the frustration caused by our wonderful city's permitting delays, I had learned that my responsibilities in this whole restaurant thing were increasing each day. Like the day Missy decided to call me on the trading floor, a day that was particularly very bad for the high yield corporate bond market, which meant it was particularly very bad for me. And in her not most calm voice said that I needed to fire the plumber, the engineer, the electrician, and the GC. I took the phone off of my ear, took a deep breath, put it back on, and in my calmest voice back said, okay, cool, I'll handle it. Literally while I was Googling, what is GC? <laughs> So at the end of the day, I knew this was her big shot. And I wanted her to go into this space every single day excited, knowing that she was going to be her most confident and happiest self. And I would take care of everything else in order to just try to take a little bit of the pressure off of her. Then with two weeks left, until opening night, all of the RSBs, RSVPs for friends and family had been out, come back and counted. The light at the end of the tunnel was staring us both in the face. We were opening this restaurant finally, and Missy and I had just left the restaurant to go back home at an ungodly hour, and midway through going over the Williamsburg Bridge, she decided to blurt out, this is the worst decision I've ever made in my life. <laughs> Now, I was exhausted and in a daze, so I picked up my head and I looked at her and I said, excuse me, wh what did you just say? <laughs> and even more adamantly, she said, and aggressively, this is the worst decision I have ever made in my life. A lot of F-bombs in that one. <laughs> and the only thing that I could think to do was grab her by the shoulders, shake her, kind of physically, but I w kept on saying adamantly, I believe in you and I believe in us and we are going to do this. Then 10 minutes later, we arrived at the door of our apartment, got out, most likely got a two out of five on our Uber rating from that driver. <laughs> then on opening night, we're here, it's showtime, and I decided to have a panic attack. I left my office, I jumped on the L train and somewhere underneath the East River, for the first time, I decided I was gonna ask myself, what if we bomb? <laughs> I got off at the subway stop at the Bedford Avenue. I nervously and quickly walked to Lilia in a full body sweat. It was the <laughs> middle of January, 16 degrees outside. And upon entering, I went right into the bathroom without saying hello to anybody. I splashed water on my face, I took some deep breaths. And then I went out onto the dining room floor still trying to collect my thoughts, and I saw Missy at the pass with this big wood fire blazing behind her, manning her rocket ship, and she was at peace. And I knew Lilia was gonna be enough. All right, now it's my turn to tell you that it wasn't always easy. Sean didn't know what a pass was. Um. <laughs> That's a true story. That's so true. Uh, Sean had never worked a day on a floor except of the trading floor. He had never been in a restaurant. I ate there a lot. I ate a lot. I stood at the pass and I watched him and he was so excited to be there every night. He was like a kid who was experiencing sugar for the first time. His eyes like wide open and ready to jump in. Every night he would say, coach, can you put me in the pasta station? And I'd be like, no, can you just like stay over there? I gotta, I gotta watch I'm tickets. still asking. Still asking, he hasn't, he hasn't gotten a shift yet. Um, <laughs> I, I still had the fine dining in me. We had opened this restaurant, the restaurant that I wanted to go to on my days off, but I had these standards that I didn't know how to let go of. Thank you, Tony Montuano from Spiaggia. Um, <laughs> in, in those first few weeks, I saw some crazy stuff. I watched Sean try and comfort a party of four who had waited almost an hour past the reservation, brought them champagne, holding four glasses like they were red solo cups at a frat party, and they were his buddies. I didn't know I needed to use a tray. I watched him 
sit down at tables so excited, whether they were stranger or his parents, so excited to ask someone how their experience was going, how they liked the food, right as the pasta got dropped on the table. And I, would, and I would be staring at him across the room, hoping that he would catch my eye. But all I watched was pasta getting cold and clumpy and gross. <laughs> but he was doing what he was best at. He was talking to people, but it infuriated me. <laughs> I watched him deliver gelato with soft serve at Lilia. And I watched him go to the soft serve machine, do it himself. Drop the gelato, bar 13, closest to the kitchen. Single diner, nice gentleman. Want to make him feel special. And then I watched him take a plastic spoon off my station and shove it in the top of the gelato for the gentleman. So literally, I would do these things and I would turn back to the pass with this big smile from ear to ear, looking for some sort of approval from my partner, like a puppy looking for a treat. And the only thing that I was met with was Missy's face, as red as a San Marzano tomato, summonsing me to the pass to scold me. Still happening five years later. He did all the technical stuff so, so, so wrong, but for all of the right reasons. And it was during these first few weeks that I understand he, he I understood that he had this incredible, incredible gift for hospitality. He could talk to anyone, stranger, a kid, a family member, a celebrity, all in the same manner. He made everyone feel welcome and he made everyone feel at home. And I watched this happen night after night. I realized that indeed I had not made the worst decision of my life, but probably the best. Sean never intended to work the floor or be the host of the restaurant. He simply wanted to help me realize my dream of opening a restaurant and he really intended on having minimal involvement but he was so into it and he was so happy that I definitely thought there was more to the story. Thank you. I could tell you. Hospitality, see? Um, it, it is my joyful duty to help make every day a good day for anyone who I come in contact with. At every stage throughout my life, whether it was on a court or a field, in a classroom or a trading floor, I've relied on my ability to connect with people genuinely, to build trust to provide protection and comfort with the hope of positively impacting a brief moment or a hard day. You can ask any friend, boss, teammate, or, or a coach of mine, and they'll tell you, I've never been one to shy away from blunt feedback. However, never in my life was I so excited to be getting it while making all those mistakes on the floor of our restaurants. I didn't even hear all the bad words Missy called me when she was doing it. And, um, about a month after opening, on one of our late night trips home, Missy turned to me and asked, in the back of an Uber, if I was okay. She knew I was staying at Lilia until close, getting to my day job at 5.30 a.m., and rushing back to the restaurant by the time service had started that night, night after night. I assured her I had never felt better. And she said, well, that's good. I've never seen anyone so good on the floor and inspiring a team the way you are. You should keep doing this every night. I said, oh, oh, I am, I will. And she closed the door to her apartment. And those next eight steps that led to mine never felt so long. Because two years prior, while pitching the idea to my wife, Maria, to become Missy's partner, I made two promises. I wouldn't be there every night. <laughs> <laughs> And I, um, I did not want to be an absent dad or husband. And only 30 days into this rocket ship being launched, I had broken not one, but both. So at 1.45 a.m., I awoke Maria and began to apologize. And my rock wrapped in rose petals wouldn't let me finish. She said, don't stop. We'll move to Williamsburg and we'll make it work. Missy had encouraged me and Maria had empowered me. Their belief in me was all I needed to find the courage to risk being my true self. It was the most important night of my life. I had never felt more alive doing what made me happiest, knowing I was best at it on the restaurant floor. Night after night, 
The smiles I was met with from guests and team members fed my soul and ignited a fire inside of me that I'd never want to be put out. It was enough, so was I, and now so were we. Our best moments have been when we're in sync. And there have been many of those moments, but there also have been many moments where we weren't. It's not always to be in, easy to be in sync with any human being, much less a business partner. We are really different individuals with obviously pretty similar sense of humor. Um, <laughs> we have our own personal goals, and we also have a lot of goals we want to achieve together. And being in sync wasn't just about Sean deciding to go all in on hospitality. It's helpful to have him focused on it most of the time. Um, but when we're really in sync is when we are really communicating well. And that also doesn't always happen, but we certainly have made it a priority in our partnership, and we try in the toughest times to, to communicate. And when we can focus on those common goals, but keep our sense of ourselves and our individuality. We have a plan, and it's to play the long game. And we're not eager to expand rapidly. We get asked every day, what's next? When's your next restaurant? Da, da, da. Um, and we think about the future and how to move at a really calculated pace with a very directed vision that allows us to focus on quality and our culture as we build Grove House. It's been a really, really long and great five years since I arrived at Sean's door full of tears. And so much has transpired for both of us together and separately. I think we've had the highest of highs and the lowest of lows that two people could possibly have. We moved to Williamsburg eight months after Lilia opened. We moved into the same building. <laughs> I just moved out after 10 years. Um, it hurts. I, <laughs> it was a place I said I didn't even want to open a restaurant. And I certainly always said, yeah, yeah, I'll open a restaurant there, but I'm never moving there. Um, and it's now really, truly home for, for both of us three years later. Sean's family grew, and he had twin boys uh, who happened to also be my godsons. I was diagnosed with breast cancer a year and a half after opening Lilia and beat it. Um, I fell in love with an amazing woman right after breast cancer. Uh, we opened Missy, our second restaurant in Williamsburg, and then Sean finally left his finance job in January of this year to concentrate fully on hospitality and on Grove House. And to come full circle, the last time we were together in this great city of Chicago was two years ago when Missy won James Beard Best Chef New York. While accepting her achievement, she was reserved and gracious, thanking many people who helped make her journey possible. The recognition was no longer what drove her. It was a byproduct of waking up every morning excited to do what she was happiest doing. And there I was, next to Maria, in the second row, a complete puddle. <laughs> I couldn't breathe, I was crying so hard. It was truly the ugliest of ugly cries. <laughs> But besides marrying Maria and the birth of our children, it was the happiest moment of my life. And it had nothing to do with an award. In that instant, when her name was called, I thought about the personal lows that we desperately fought through while we were friends and neighbors, the insurmountable odds we overcame together as partners, the overwhelming pride we had in why we built Grove House the great joy we shared knowing others were excited to be a part of it as we're growing. And for me, it was a wonderful blessing to raise my family within this new one we were forming. So what is enough anyway? For us, it starts with a belief in yourself, then having the courage to risk being your true self. It makes us obsessed with making others feel fulfilled, it helps us find grit when we do fail, and it motivates us to enjoy each day and keeps us excited for tomorrow. We hope that our stories and story <laughs> gives you a reason to believe you are and can be enough. Thank you.
for listening. Thank you, guys.